Okay, so we're going to try and start this again. <laughs> so this is an episode of um, nonfiction narrative discourses, aka beyond the bio of uh, what I'm trying to do here is um, get to know faculty and staff and graduates better, um, bridge some gaps, find out where you're from, how or why you got here, um, why you teach what you teach, and what types of things are you passionate about. So. Um, First of all, where are you from? Uh, with that question, um, it's a, always an interesting, complicated one when you have someone that's a first generation immigrant. So the first thing in my head, I was like, well, you know, um, I'm mainly from Los Angeles, right? Like that's where I've lived most of my life. But okay. I was originally born in Iran and I came right uh, right before the Islamic revolution that ended up happening. Um, so uh, my family and I were sort of stuck in America, uh, happily though, <laughs> and that was sort of the beginning of the life. And so I started off in Indiana, believe it or not, because my father was a PhD student there and then traveled uh, east to Delaware and then back west to California after that. Okay, so how long did you stay in each place? Oh, we want specifics. Okay, <laughs> this is, this is like you're getting into the, this is really beyond the bio. You yes, are, that's right. Okay. We're going deep. Okay, okay. So <laughs> let's go deep. So in Indiana, I was there for maybe four years, five years. Okay. And then I was four years in um, New Jersey. Okay. And then about 10 years or so in Delaware my like sort of uh, middle school to uh, early college, you know, end of college. And then I did my MFA at uh, the Jack Kerouac School at Naropa University in Colorado. And then in 2005, I ended up in Los Angeles. Okay. And I was in Los Angeles for maybe four years. And then I visited Korea and taught at Yonsei University for two years in Seoul, Korea. And then I came back to America in 2009 and uh, started making films. That's when the film career started there. So every year I made a different film uh, since then till now and mainly in Los Angeles for the most okay. part. And yeah. you, am I correct in understanding that you just started at SIU? Like this is- Yes, literally in August 16th. Well, welcome so, aboard. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here. Good, um, good. I'm definitely glad. so much fun. Yeah. So part of what I want to know is you started off, you, you said you did your MFA. That was in creative writing. Is that right? Yeah. So it, actually my undergrad, um, my father being the first generation immigrant that he was, did not want me to do anything associated with the arts. Like, I was good at acting, I was good at music, I was good at writing. There were so many possibilities, but mainly I wanted to be an actor. That was the dream. And um, I didn't get a chance to do that at all. I ended up going right to the state school, you know, that, that was there. And that was the only place I could apply. Um, I went for one year and then basically dropped out and joined a rock band. <laughs> and, uh, Living toward... the American dream. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, toured with them for about three years, mainly in the tri-state area. You know, we went as far south as Richmond, Virginia. Okay. Um, and once the band, because bands only have a certain shelf life, you know, it can only keep going for so long. After that, I went back to Delaware, finished my undergrad, um, and I had started as a neuroscience major, but then shifted over to English literature. because So they didn't was have that... Was that a big to do in your family, the, the shift of majors? Oh, it was a huge, huge deal um, mm -hmm. what I did because my father was, you know, a you know, he was a very famous uh, scientist. And so he wanted me to follow in the footsteps and he would say things like, Pirus, you are the one that you are the only one that can follow That's me in doing this. OK, <laughs> so we have to work hard to make this happen you know he, he he would make me study sats like when i was seven wow like four hours a day at like a little desk you know things like that or give me and it wasn't like sats like 
he would give me his own physics problems, wow. if you can imagine. Um, so actually on my GRE verbal for the, uh, uh, for the GRE for grad school, I did, I almost got a perfect score in math without studying. Oh my goodness. And I did better in that than, than the actual verbal. Sort wow. Of yeah. So, so yes, uh, he basically uh, didn't want to talk to me for two years. Oh, but you know, he would come to some of the concerts with the band and it was just a slow, gradual thing. Uh, I had to be the first one to do it. And I think it was a shock. And there was a lot of worry, you know, when you're a first generation immigrant and your child decides to be an artist, they don't know what that is. Right. And so from my perspective as a young man, I was like, oh, you, you, you don't understand me. I'm out of here. You know, yeah. um, we get that sort of you're the band kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But it wasn't actually that it was there was a deep empathy, a deep compassion, a deep worry there. But I didn't realize it. I didn't know it at that that moment. Right. And um, so basically for me, it was a lifelong journey to see the brilliance of my parents uh, and and how they were able to sort of help me along in this becoming an American journey where they also became more American over time. Sure. So all my brothers are actually in the entertainment industry now. Really? Yeah. So my my youngest brother, Panna, is a music producer and does uh, music for television and films. And my other brother, Paymon, is a, a writer for television. Oh, um, neat. Yeah. So everybody ended up in the industry. And so he had three sons that all became artists in How the end. I had, to, I had to sort of pave the way. And if you're the firstborn, that's usually the most difficult in immigrant families. And so I joined the band and then I went back and finished the degree in something I liked, which was literature. And since they didn't have a film program, I basically took all film classes. Okay. But, but that was my way of getting, you know, something adjacent to it. Okay. And after that, I was like, you know, I love writing. I like lyrics. And it's, it was sort of like, I had uh, in my younger formative years, I went to the Governor's School for Excellence for theater. And I did some training with David Howie of the Royal Shakespeare Company. So there was a lot of uh, love and training with acting and so many plays. And even when I was in undergrad, I was doing theater and things like that. But then um, once I joined the band, it was sort of almost performance art. And it was really a music career. Like I would show up with the band and they'd be like, you don't know who Led Zeppelin is? Uh -huh. All right, uh, listen to this. We're going to sing this tomorrow. You don't know who Jane's Addiction is? All right, listen to this. We're going to play this tomorrow. You don't know. Ooh, Chili talk about a quick education. And they were really, really talented. Like they had gone to Berkeley School of Music. They were, you know, and they were all from different cultures. Uh, the guitarist was uh, Indian. The bass player was from Panama. The drummer was half Iranian, half American. So we had this whole multicultural thing going with the sort of rock, pop, funk, uh, you know, punk uh, uh, scene there. Um, so that was the music education. And so it was only natural that the next thing I would learn is the writing. Sure. And uh, so when I was actually in the undergrad and had gone back to school, I saw an interview with Bobby Louise Hawkins, who was one of the fiction instructors there. And um, I just read the interview and she just talked about community. And she talked about, you know, what it was to go to the Jack Kerouac school, how Naropa was like a Buddhist inspired school. And I was like, this is the school for me. Yeah. So I literally did not apply to any other writing program. Oh, wow. I only applied there, I got in as a poet. Actually. Oh, wow. So I showed up, I did poetry my first year and translation. And I worked with Ann Waldman and Anselm Hollow and Ed Sanders and like all the original beats, you know, it wow. was like, it's like you, you suddenly went back to like 1969 or something. And it, it had the energy, the place had the energy. Neat. And then um, I took Bobby's course. And so 
I ended up in her class and it was a sort of like a fiction building blocks. I think it was called the feeling tone. Hmm. And she would say to she, say to us, she's like, um, a great writer is a great talker and a great talker is a great writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. And she would make us talk our stories to each other. So she would actually have students come to her house and so instead of like workshopping in the classroom, you go to her house, you bring your story and then she'd be like, okay. Um, and she'd read it to you. Oh, wow. And she'd be like, oh, smoosh. Oh, honey, what is this word smoosh? <laughs> I was like, it's just smush, like squash. She's like, oh, it just sounds awful, honey. Let's change that. You know, and so it was a very incredible way of editing. It was almost like she was a, a, a musician. She was like sonically hearing the phrases, performing it with you. Yeah. And, and she was the first one that encouraged me to tell my, my family stories. She was like, this is what you need to be doing. And I also had a lot of encouragement from Junior Burke who was a singer songwriter that wrote songs for Bob Dylan and John Lee Hooker, who was also there at the program and, and had done screenplays. Uh, for, uh, you know, one film he did with David Carradine and Muriel Hemingway, I forget the title of the film. And so I actually did one semester with him writing screenplays as well, while right. I was there. So in essence, it, even though they didn't have this sort of program, um, Bobby was like, oh, honey, you need to get out of poetry and join fiction with us. Uh -huh. All those poets just want to be rock stars. Just come over here. And I go, how do I do that? Uh -huh. She's like, Re reapply. So I reapplied. So I was both a poetry student. And then the very next year, I was a fiction student. So I got the best of all worlds. Nice. And you were uh, already a rock star. So you didn't need to do that part anymore. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Yes, I had I had had the experience of, of being in the limelight in that way. And um, after that, it, I was sort of in Boulder, Colorado. And I don't know if you know the area, mm -hmm. there really wasn't any job for an entertainer. Mm. There wasn't any kind of work. And I, I you know, I had a, a relationship that ended. I was like, I don't know what to really do. And then I had already gotten an agent for the Whopper Strategies, which is behind you. Okay. So that was where, as soon as I graduated, I just wrote three novels right away. Nice. And then uh, submitted it, got an agent, got it published. And I was like, okay, what's next? And I talked to a friend and they were like, uh, uh, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. You know, I, I guess I could go back and do a master's in education and become, you know, like a high school teacher or something or and, and I was like, the other thing I could do is just move to Los Angeles. I mean, I got no money. I got nothing. I got $338 and a Honda Prelude. <laughs> and my friend said, well, um, which one is easiest? And I was like, oh, just go do a master's degree. Of course, that's, that's easier. He's like, yeah, peers, but, you know, what's easiest isn't always the one with the least amount of risk. And then I was like, oh, I understand. Like, it's about what you're passionate about, what you want to do, what, what turns you on, what makes you alive. And I was like, well, for me, it's always the scariest thing. So the scariest thing is always what turns me on the most and makes me the most excited. I actually read when I was like 16, there was like a little teeny bopper magazine with, with the interview with Brad Pitt. Yeah. And uh, he said something like, uh, whatever I'm afraid of is the role that I take. And wow. that's always stuck with me. And that's sort of been my direction forward through life. So I was like, yeah, going to LA is scary, but how much fun will it be? Let's just try it. So on July 11th, uh, 2005, I just drove across the country hmm. like Jack Kerouac. And um, within two weeks, my brother had already been there. And he was uh, babysitting, well, dog sitting a house for a famous actress. Okay. And um, as soon as I got there, he's like, well, why don't you just stay with me at this mansion in the Hollywood Hills? 
And Why I was not? like, <laughs> I was like, wow, I really like Hollywood. It's wonderful. <laughs> and then I stay with him for a couple of weeks. And then he was, his roommate was like, um, would you like to work at the uh, production company, the, the television production company that I'm at? And I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I had this policy at that time, which was just say yes to everything. Okay. Um, so I just did it. So within two weeks of being there, I was working as a dub logger, which is a person that basically transcribes videotape. Okay. So I was watching Jackass and then typing out Jackass for them. Nice. Um, and then within two months, I heard of a job as an associate producer. And I was like, what does an associate producer do? And they're like, sort of gave me a description. You know, you do this for, you know, you're sort of an assistant, you do this type of research, you know, it's a nationally syndicated program. And I went up to the head producer and I was like, I can do it. And they looked at me like, what? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I've got a master's degree. I've been a booking agent, you know, and, and this is the other interesting thing about me when I was in that rock and roll period um, for fun, I decided to take as many jobs as possible from the temp agency. Sure. So like every week I would be a different thing. Mm -hmm. So I was like road crew a uh, CR wings, a uh, wing person that's like takes the wings out of the fryer, uh, right. a hair salon stylist. So I had like 55 jobs because I was really interested in learning the language of different occupations and different people. And I thought it'd make me a better storyteller, a better writer. For sure. Cause then you get so much more experience just at everything and listening to people and doing things you never thought you would do. Yeah. And you, you learn how to be with every kind of person. Yeah. It makes you like in, in extremely empathetic and it puts you in other people's shoes and it, it sort of takes away the, any judgments you might've had about a, a, a group of people that might be different from you in any way. You're just like, Oh, I know what it's like to, to you know, to point brick now. Mm -hmm. I, I know what it's like to do this job. Um, so I just thought I could be an associate producer of a television program. And so in Hollywood, the, the idea is to really knock you off your center. So they're always trying to frazzle you to make sure you cannot be frazzled mm. so that you remain steady and grounded, even in the face of turmoil or chaos. Mm -hmm. If they can see that kind of, uh, focus and determination, you're going to get the job. So they were just like, what would you do in this situation? And I was like, oh, I was a booking agent. I would do this because of that. What would you do in this situation? Oh, you know, I helped Bobby book some shows here in New York. I would do this because of that situation. And then they were like, what job do you want? And I said, your job looks pretty good. Nice. And that was it. You know, they, they, they basically pulled me aside and they said, you're the fastest rising associate producer in Hollywood history. Um, they said, you got the job. If you screw up, you're fired. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the beginning in television. And I just rose the ranks. So I went from associate producer on another show uh, to a producer on another show to a post-production coordinator in charge of a team of 25. And so they were doing shows like UFO Mysteries, Barbecue with Bobby Flay, uh, Rachel Ray, Look what I did for Home and Garden, Craft Lab for the DIY Network. And I went and just kept going with that for almost three years. Then when there was the writer's strike and I was just about to work for the E! Network, um, they asked me to be a producer with Helmut Lang and Carl Lockerfeld. And I was nice. like, I was like, you know, I didn't know if it was for me, TV. Okay. Because all the producers I saw, they were basically run down by the time they were 40 and dying of heart attacks because the pressure and the stress was, was high. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, something was pulling me in a different direction. It didn't feel right. I was like, I feel like I'm supposed to do a novel of this. I'm supposed to make fun of television. I don't know what it is. And um, one of my friends who was a poet was like, why don't you come teach poetry for six months in Korea? And I was like, Korea? I don't know anything about Korea. And he's like, just come. And again, it was one of those situations where someone was just like, here it is. It's easy. It's scary. 
okay. I mean, six months, what could happen? So within those six months, I went there. Um, what was, it was called Duxong Women's University. And I taught there for a year and I ended up meeting who had, who had become my wife at that time and yeah. ended up staying for two years. And then another friend who was a poet was teaching at Yonsei University and was like, teach over here. And that, I was like, okay. So I just kept saying yes to things. Wow. And then suddenly um, that same poet at Yonsei University is now the head of the creative writing program there. Uh, Lauren Goodman, um, he saw that I was reading a book called The Human War. And this was written by the author Noah Cicero. And it, it basically tells the story of a writer uh, the day the Iraq war was declared in 2003. Mm. And he sort of doesn't understand why there's a war on television when there's so much poverty in his hometown of Youngstown, Ohio. And it's so impoverished there why isn't the country sort of focusing and helping that community rather than dealing with a war at this present moment? Mm -hmm. And Lauren was like, are you reading that book? Cause I'd like to read it. And I was, I loaned it to him and he gave it back to me. And I was like, he really liked that book. And I just started reading it one night. And that night I fell asleep. And for about 30 days after that, every night I dreamt of the book like a movie in my head, hmm. like I would see the movie until finally I was like, this, it, these dreams are so loud that I have to do something about this. So I called Noah from Korea and I was like, did anybody option your book as a film? And he said, my, the, the people from my name is Earl called the TV show. Sure. They said that it was, uh, it was too, too uh, short. And I was like, oh, he doesn't realize that you can actually extend or, you know, work with whoever. And I was like, sure. well, I would like to option the book. I was like, I don't know if I'll make it, but I'll option it. And I optioned it right there with him. And I think within a week, I flew to Youngstown, Ohio from Korea, met with Noah in the Denny's that he writes about in the book. Oh, neat. And um, he's like, you're the only person that can make this movie. I think what he meant was, not only was I the only person that could make it, but maybe I was the only person that would make it, ah. you know, but, but not in a negative way. It was more like um, he knew I cared enough about it that I could tell the story correctly, you know? Sure. And as I was going through Youngstown, it felt like National Geographic. Like it felt like a war-torn community. So I was like, oh, this is a perfect contrast to, you know, like, I don't have to build that. It's already what it needs to be. Right. I could not create that production value. Right. So I was like, okay. And I went outside of the Denny's and I called my friend, Thomas Henwood, uh, who I went to uh, the Jack Kerouac school with. And I just said, I knew he was in Brooklyn. And I said, uh, hey, um, you want to make a movie? And he just said, yeah, sure. And so I went from Korea to the Denny's and then that same day I drove to Brooklyn and I had a meeting with Thomas Henwood and Mark Parcia, who was my drummer in that first band. And one was working at NYU in charge of the technical equipment and the other was, you know, making commercials and things like that. After we were done the meeting, Thomas is like, so what do you want to do with this project? Are you like the producer? Are you what? I was like, come on, Tom, you know, I'm the director. <laughs> I, I could tell where he was going. He's like, what do you think about us co-directing this and co-producing it? And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Because he had a lot of experience making commercials. He had a lot more, at that time, more technical experience than I did, whereas I had more theatrical experience, producing experience. I was like, this is a good team. Um, and that was the, the first film. And so I think we, we made it for just under 150 to $200,000. We raised it from private investments, put it out there and it did really well for us. And that was the beginning of the journey. And since then, basically every year, I tried to do a different genre of film. And since I didn't go to the traditional film school, 
I felt like I needed to challenge myself. Um, but what I quickly realized is that I had all the skills. So I had done the acting, I had done the music, I had done the writing, I had done the producing. And then after the first film, I knew how to do the directing. And so it was like the next six feature films that I did. So I think Shoplifting from American Apparel was the next film, uh, which was written by Tao Lin and I optioned that. And that went to all 12 cities in America and was sold out everywhere and did well. And then I did Brad Warner's Hardcore Zen, which was a documentary, uh, Control Alt Delete, which was about uh, sort of before the Me Too movement, <laughs> it was sort of a precursor to it. Uh, and then we had Zombie Bounty Hunter MD that was making fun of uh, Hits Are Everything Universe and a sort of a documentary crew documents the onset of a zombie apocalypse. And they start posting the videos, hoping it'll pay, it'll pay their rent. But of course, no one believes that it's real. Okay. So they keep posting, you know, they're like, okay, well, let's get fake zombies with the real zombies and, you know, hijinks ensues. Funny. So really my next, next phase was, was becoming a refined director. And then it wasn't until, and this whole time while I was doing that, I was teaching. So I was doing classes at UCLA. Um, and so because of the popularity of the shoplifting film, they gave me sort of carte blanche to teach any class I wanted. Nice. So I said, why don't I do making webisodes? And this was before streaming content. I was like, if you don't get in on that, you're going to lose out. They're like, okay, that's your class. Go ahead. Um, and I was also teaching at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And that's sort of uh, really putting out uh, actors, but they're also teaching them writing, film studies, all the basic things that they'll need so they can sort of survive in the industry, even create things in the industry. So, um, and then it was right around that time that um, the, my partner wanted to go back to Korea. Uh, their parent had passed away. And so they had to deal with things. And uh, I ended up taking a job, another job in Korea, which was teaching film, you know, full-time faculty position. And while I was there, I was like, I heard, I've always heard about this PhD program called the European Graduate School. And I didn't know if it was real because it sounded so amazing to me. It was like Slavoj Žižek, te you know, teaches there, Judith Butler. And I was like, all these people, like I read their essays. And I was like, that can't be real, you know? Um, but I ended up, um, basically talking to one of the fellow business professors while I was there and they were like what do you want to do you know like you're you're sort of you're sort of this filmmaker you're so, you're this director you could just keep directing you could just go into Hollywood production and you know that's your career or you could be a professor like what what are you doing here and, and I said well I'd like to do both and they, they had been doing advising for other sort of uh, businesses, real, you know, large scale companies. And he was like, well, let me give you, you know, a real advisement. And they're like, well, why don't you, um, why don't you do both? But why don't you serve it by doing a PhD? And I was like, well, you know, the MFA is the terminal degree of this. I don't think I need another PhD on top of it. And, and, and he was like, well, hold on. He's like, he's like, well, if you do it, your salary raises by a certain amount because you all you have the <laughs> and then he was like you could also the type of you know filmmaker you are you know you do very serious things you know very gripping things you also do sort of the comedic with a, a zombie film he's like you could sort of write the punk rock film manual on independent filmmaking but make it informal after, you, after you've done a, a formal PhD discussing something uh, within cinema. And he said, then you could publish the, the selections uh, from your PhD thesis also in magazines and you are gonna get payments for all of that. And he said, this is kind of a way forward for you. And then that thesis that you create or th that body of work 
can be the textbook in the classes that you teach. Nice. And I was like, huh, you know, and the more and more he talked about, it, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to check this out. And he's like, why don't you just do a PhD at Yonsei? They love you there, you know? And I was like, oh, well, I guess I could do that. Um, and so I talked to one of my friends. They're like, yeah, but it's going to take seven years. Ooh, and I was yeah. like, ooh. And they were like, and you could only do it in English. And I was like, well, no, no, it has to be cinema, you know, cinema, you know, media and communication, something. And I went back to this European graduate school and I told the, the you know, the, the business professor, I was like, well, there's this other school, but I don't know if I should do it because you know, I've already went to the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. It sounds so like hippie and out there. It's a mouthful, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why they always say Naropa. You know, it's much easier. But I was like, I already went there. So if I went to the European Graduate School, which is like avant-garde, isn't that just like super? I've become like this super avant-garde kind of thing. And then the business professor looks at me. Holly is like, yeah, but peers, he's like, you are that, like yeah. you are, you are exactly that. It's perfect for you for a reason. So why are you resisting what's easy? Right. And then as soon as he said that, I remembered the other friend talking about the easiness of life and the fear. Um, and I just applied, I got in. And that summer, uh, you know, uh, the way that European Graduate School is structured is it's for working professionals. Okay. So you go for the summers, you know, okay. you go okay. for two summers and then you're, then you're in uh, dissertation mode with okay. your advisor. And then you write for however many years, seven years is the limit, but you can finish in four. So it's a, it's a bit speedier, but it's just as uh, rigorous as going to Princeton or one of these schools because all the faculty are from these, from these top programs. Right. And so I go to school and lo and behold, who are my teachers my first semester? Barbara Hammer, you know, uh, one of the most amazing uh, uh, filmmakers out there, right? Mike Figgis, who did Leaving Las Vegas. Mm. And he ended up becoming my thesis advisor. So nice. he was my advisor the whole time. Vim Vendors. Yeah, did, huge. You know, yeah. And Terrence Malick. Nice. That's my first semester at European. So it was like, it was almost like fortuitous. And there's something kind of, you know, kind of a, I don't know what it is. And, you know, maybe people would say this is kind of like frou-frou or, you know, if they believe in the great flying spaghetti monster, whatever it is that people believe in. But mm -hmm. there's, I think that when you're, you're really, focused on your passions and you're sort of paying attention to them it's almost like the entire universe is conspiring together to help you achieve whatever those dreams are sure and it's it's very hard to believe in and I feel like as a professor that is my ultimate job is helping people have hope first of all and then the belief that something can happen when you start trusting in yourself and then following that with the with a realistic approach and a sincere work ethic. And so it was like everything got aligned. And while I was there, they, you know, Vim Vendors was encouraging, try to make a film without a script mm. and then make a film with a script. And I started doing these experimentations that were part of my dissertation. One of them was uh, Blush, where uh, two men start teasing me about being attracted to the bartender in the small uh, village in Sassfei, Switzerland that I'm in. And then um, they're also teasing me to make a film. They're begging me. And I said, okay, well, this is the film. And they're like, what do you mean this is the film? I'm like, we're going to reenact you teasing me. And then I'm really going to talk to this person that you think I have a crush on and I'm blushing about, and we'll see what happens. Um, and so that became sort of this exploration into sort of documentary fiction or hybrid cinema. Yeah, it's almost like a collage piece. I think I, I watched it. If, if mm. that's, is the whole thing on your website? 
Yeah, all the films are there. Okay, sure. I watched it. Yeah, it, it feels like a collage piece because if there's kind of little bits and pieces that are all kind of pasted together, there's not like you understand what's going on, but there's not one arc where it's like beginning, middle and end. You're just getting kind of these little snippets and then they're put together very nicely. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's the interesting thing about um, when you're when you're sort of on this like evolutionary journey of trying to be trying to be a good storyteller, right? It's that you kind of have to push yourself in every direction. It's almost like the pizza dough. You're like, you got to knead it and push it. And until you sort of, you, you get it. And I, I, I think if I didn't make that film control alt delete, which had so much negative space. And in that film, there's so much I leave out. If I didn't work in that format, I would have never been able to make a blush. But it's in making blush that you suddenly get more adventurous. And then you're like, well, what happens if we turn this a different way? Um, and so I made make film great again. And which was really just the premise of taking a, a Make America Great hat again, putting it on the head of Zen priest and punk rocker Brad Warner and walking down Hollywood Boulevard. And I sort of wrote a script and that was sort of the constrained uh, cinema that, that I came up with. And the day of the shoot, everything went wrong. You know, like Brad didn't know his lines, you know, everyone showed up late and because I had made blush, which was almost improvisational in its style, right? right? You're sort of allowing it to be as you're doing something that you you really shouldn't allow to be in filmmaking. It was like a combination of theater and cinema, right? Yeah. That's, that's kind of a good way of describing it. Um, and so I just used it again, but this time from the point of editing. Okay. So it's like, as you're watching the film, you start having other people comment on the film. So the behind the scenes of the film ends up being us as the Muppeteers talking about the film that we made. Right. So suddenly midway through, you have Brad Warner and Nemanja Mitrovic, who's the Associate Dean of the European Graduate School on Zoom, talking to me about how my films probably aren't gonna make film great again, because I am not J.J. Uh, Abrams or make <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> but then they bring up the point of, you know, uh, Dr. Mitrovich brings up the point that he's translating Blanchot right now. And he, he, he brings up the point that um, when Star Wars came out, they made this assessment, or let's say this, <laughs> their advertisement said, Star Wars has 300 special effects. 2001 Space Odyssey had 30. So therefore, Star Wars is a much better film than 2001 Space Odyssey by Kubrick, which of course is not true. No, right? not at all. Well, then uh, Nemanja makes the point, he said, well, him and his friends spent two years translating Maurice Blanchot's uh, poetry book. And at the end of the, the, this sort of journey, they got it published and they got $500 for the two years worth of work. And they have to split that among two people. Oh, shoot. So all that work, and that was the result, but he was saying it was worth it because at least if this idea touches one person, then that changes the scope whoever reads it, you don't know. And then yeah. Brad Warner makes the point that, you know, sort of piggybacking off of uh, Nemanja that, you know, uh, Dogen, the uh, Zen teacher was read by maybe 30 people at that time. And now is read by millions. Yeah. So you really don't know when you're making something. We can't look at this sort of hits or everything universe. And, you know, this has got this many likes. So therefore this has value value might actually be the thing that's making us think or the thing that sort of catapults or catalyzes another artist in their thinking right and, and how important that is so i think with that film and th those films that i did 
this is what ultimately led me to my first film. So even though I've done, you know, maybe it's uh, something like 50 films at this point, you know, seven features, it was only until I made Sometimes I Dream in Farsi that I sort of realized my style, my voice, and what I needed to bring to cinema. And I was actually making another comedy in the vein of a make film great again or blush. And that was called Apocalypse Later. And the idea was all these poets, a Zen priest, Brad Warner again, uh, um, an actor, Ray Horatian, uh, they would come together and they would tell me the story of the film based on the title alone, which was Apocalypse Later. And they're just like, you know, there's a girl in the woods, she's hungry. And they're giving me this post-apocalyptic tale. And I shoot for one year on this, Holly. One year I shoot this movie. And I shoot the, the woman in the woods, this whole adventure. And I keep coming back to the group. They tell me what it should be. I go off, I shoot the film. Then finally the Broadway uh, singer and dancer, Kevin Ramsey, the, the actor, he's one of the group. And he suddenly asked me, he says, Piru's, he says, uh, what was your apocalypse? And suddenly in that moment, this was the time when uh, President Trump was, uh, you know, doing the Muslim ban. And he was, there was also the whole issue with the, the, the children at the border in Mexico. And I suddenly remembered a memory that I completely forgotten, which was a barber had refused to cut my hair when I was mm -hmm. nine years old. Mm -hmm. and my dad refused to leave and did the sit-in. The police arrived, and I thought my dad and I were going to be taken away forever, mainly my dad, yeah. and he was going to be arrested, and I was crying and crying, and suddenly right there on this, this film set where I have made these comedic films up to this point, you know, just these, just, you know, jovial things, I am bawling my eyes out on camera, wow. and the camera operator runs in and is just like, Piers, what's going on? You know, like they thought I'd fallen, you know. Right. The next day I go into therapy and the therapist is like, you need to, this is serious trauma. Mm. And she was like, let's try some gestalt therapy where mm -hmm. you do role plays. She's like, I want you to play, you know, the sort of racist barber that did that to you. I want you to play your father. I want you to play yourself. We do one of these triangulations and I'm like, oh, no, this is too good. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, we need to save it for the camera. Oh, boy. And so that began the journey of about four or five years uh, to making this film that just, it just played the Galway Film Fleet in Ireland, and it's still playing festivals now. Nice. And I'll, I'll basically be taking it to high schools and colleges, and it's just showing me dealing with that trauma and microaggressions, my father and I going back to uh, the barbershop, uh, me talking to the barber. And then the interesting thing that happens is my entire crew and all the people in my life, I end up creating a microcosm of America mm. because everyone starts arguing in the same ways uh, that we sort of saw all over uh, the country and on the news. And not only did they do that, but all that was happening as I was making the film. So the pandemics happening, the, the, uh, the George Floyd protests are happening. Literally two blocks from my apartment was mm. the Black Lives Matter uh, protests where I literally went out where I had filmed a little kid that was like me for a reenactment. Flash forward two months later, and I'm getting hit by tear gas in the same exact part. So it, it ended up being um, a very transformative film. And I came up with this way of telling a story, as you can see behind me, all these panels. So this is the storyboard of the entire film here. Sure. And so what I saw was I could actually use this as the behind the scenes. And then it comes in front of the scenes in a way. So the things you don't have archival footage for, I could bring the panel or animate it. And it sort of tells a story. And I could also voice these cartoon characters. And it sort of melded with this nine-year-old child that was in me. That it, and I drew it so it would be a nine-year-old 
drawing it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and somehow it, uh, through this process, it all made sense. Um, and maybe we can share the trailer for that. Is that possible? Sure. Let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to YouTube. I'm gonna go sometimes. Okay. And maybe just 30 seconds of it, just the sort of beginning. Sure, okay. Let's go back to this and then I'm going to share screen and share sound. Okay. Old, a barber refused to cut my hair because I was Iranian. Mm. One time we went to a new barber shop, I don't know why they changed it. The barber threatened to call the cops. The, the, he said, he's gonna he call said the if, you don't, if you don't do it, uh, we are going to call the police. That made me cry. I thought they were going to take my dad away. I was so afraid. The cops said he was sorry, but we had to leave. Now okay. Yeah, and so it's from that that sort of the stories between that you see the shirt came in after that. Okay. So during the pandemic, um, you know, not only was I editing the film and finishing that up, I, I didn't know how I could make cinema because I'm mm -hmm. stuck in my room like like you were, like we all were. Right. And I was like, well, I have all this archival footage of my family, right, from having just done this film. And then I was like, I also have the capacity to call my parents. And I was like, wouldn't it be wonderful to sort of have these short companion films to the longer feature that sort of help people understand what is Iranian culture? You know, what, it, what does it mean for someone to say, they immigrated to from Iran during the Islamic Revolution. What is the Islamic Revolution? You know, what is the standard American going to know about that? And and unless they were born <laughs> at that time, how are they going to understand that there was like a king and queen, and then all this stuff happened? What, what it, there there really hasn't been any media content about. Iranian Americans, or or very few about Middle Eastern Americans. Right. Maybe Rami is the only show right now that's sort of out there, right? So I was like, yeah, maybe I do that. Um, and so I just started with one, and I just I would just tell the stories, you know, short, compact stories. I would voice them in the same style that I did the Farsi film, but they were a bit more, let's say childlike <laughs> again connecting with that child maybe healing in different ways you very much captured a, a childlike voice in in those stories and i think that's that's one of the the triumphs of that series is that you've captured what you felt like as a child and it comes through in the pieces for sure which one was one of your favorites um I just watched, let's see, season three. So that was the ones where you had your first date. Oh yeah. That That's was real good adorable, where you were like, right? my, my hands were all sweaty, you know? And it's like, oh, it brings you back to being like 11 or 12. Like, oh, my hands are sweating. Why are my hands sweating so much? Like, what is this supposed, what, what's a date? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to be watching the movie or talking or what? So yeah, that, I really like those. You, you definitely got a way of capturing those um, kind of, elementary school, junior high interactions of awkwardness of just kids just not knowing um, how to deal with one another. And the, the stories with your with your bully were also very interesting, too, that, you yeah. know, it was like sometimes because bullies sometimes aren't very cut and dry. You know, sometimes right. you're actually playing with this person and sometimes you're not and you guys are angry with one another and it kind of goes back and forth. And then there's the interactions with the parents and that kind of doesn't really smooth things over and you know so that it definitely captures those experiences yeah i was thinking you know you know now that you're saying it to me you know it's sort of like when the you know a poet writes a poem they don't know exactly what it means until it's in retrospect for sure. a bit sure and when you started saying that i was like oh the maltese bully one yeah and it, i suddenly realized that I was, I was probably saying something about 
what was going on with the insurgents and sort of uh, how America has these sort of different splits that are happening and how we sort of want to come together. But there is this friction, there is this sort of talking and communication that needs to happen. And you need that kind of objective child to present a story that frames it from two different perspectives. Right. So both perspectives can look at one another and sort of recognize or be cognizant that they're both okay. And they're both the same in, in certain respects. Right. It's sort of like Huckleberry Finn, right? Uh, it's sort of like the a Mark Twain thing uh, where you sort of have the North, the Southerners think, oh, it's a book for the Southerners. The Northerners think, oh, it's a book for the North. But really it's a book about everyone coming together. And I think that's at least the hope of what st stories between can become. But now I'm seeing it's becoming something else uh, because uh, since I've come to ISU, the encouragement was for me to help students do all of this. Sure. So it's like not only make Hollywood cinema or reality television, but also to tell their personal stories in a time when uh, digital media is evolving. Right. And we're not in stand, you know, theaters are probably going to be gone in two or three years. Um, the idea of television, even the word is probably going to be gone. Yeah. It's just going to be content and it's just going to be streaming providers. Right. And so this creates a huge opportunity for students. And, and I'm sort of trying to relate this in classes now. And it's like, you know, 30, 40% are like really hooking into it, you know, yeah. like, and getting it, but it's like, some are still holding on to the idea that there is going to be a Hollywood forever. Mm. Um, and we're sort of in this place where if the students learn how to do their personal stories, it can come out in any format that they want. Right. And they can be in control of the distribution just as you are with this show. Right, and right, so right. They can, they can strip it down. They can make it a podcast. They can, they can make it a personal story and then remake it as a narrative without anyone telling the story with characters, right? Right. So there's so many approaches to it that it could become something that streams on a Netflix or Hulu, or it could go to a movie, or it could go to Instagram TV, or it could be cut in pieces and go to TikTok. Right. So really, it could go to museums. And believe it or not, after I started making this series, uh, Roger Burgle, the museum curator, contacted me during the pandemic. And he was like, I love these. He's like, I love this Farsi film. I love this. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this amazing curator that's, you know, done 330 exhibitions is talking to me about my like episodes that I thought, you know, maybe a hundred people are watching, but you're, you get surprised because it's that sort of thing where you sort of look at the likes or you look at the, uh, uh, how many hits it is right. and you think no one's watching. Oh, it's right. only got 500 views, a thousand views. No one's watching. Who is watching? Right. That is a question that people don't recognize. He was watching. Nice. And he said, I'd like to commission you to make a film for the Johann Jacobs Museum in Switzerland. And I was like, oh, huh, OK. <laughs> and so I made uh, 100 films, which was released just this August, too. So now I'm seeing that as media creators, as media artists, we have this opportunity to go anywhere. And so it's really, you know, how do you shape it or shift it just slightly for the audience to make it right, or for yourself, for the audience you've been creating. And that's ultimately what I'm, I'm trying to teach the students now, not only in script writing courses. So I, I'm teaching traditional, how do you write a Hollywood short film? How do you write a Hollywood traditional, you know, half hour show? Mm -hmm. But also, how do you do this other stuff? How do you do hybrid cinema? Yeah. How do you outline a documentary? How do you work without a script? How do you do a personal story? Sure. So that really they have this incredible arsenal 
where they can start their own production companies. They can join a production company locally. They could go to Hollywood. They could do television. They could become an auteur. Really, there is no avenue that limits them. Today in class, we, we sort of had our last class, they were ready to leave. So, yeah. You know, they were, they were just dying to go after 40 minutes, you know? Right. And I was so disappointed. I was like, no, just stay forever. You know? <laughs> but of course, you know, you know, it's the end. Uh, but at one point I talked about how I had gotten a philanthropist to support. Sometimes I dream in Farsi and they ended up being a very, very wealthy person in America. Again, I had to sort of seek that person out to get that possibility. And then one student was like, I'm going to contact Oprah. And they, you know, they were joking about Oprah. But I, you know, when I heard this, I turned to them, I said, yeah, why not? Why not? Right. You know, uh, uh, that's the big thing that this is the ultimate thing. Like if one thing that, you know, your viewers can take from this, hopefully beyond the bio, but also for themselves as media makers or, or storytellers is that we're in this really incredible time where you can connect with the artists that you really care about. You know, you, you send them a sincere message, you share the content you're making and you open up the idea for a collaboration, you ask for potential support, we need to build our communities. Yeah. We need to do it. N nobody else is going to make it for us. Right. And, and in essence, even this idea of like something as lofty as an Oprah, although it seems uh, preposterous, is actually not that far off. If you make an authentic connection with someone right. and you're making something that they care about, maybe they will support it. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's a great, that is a great message to, to end on actually okay. <laughs> that we definitely want to, we want to give people hope. We want to uh, embrace the new media that we have available to us. Um, hybridize as much as we can use what's available. That's kind of one of the ideas of this digital humanities lab is it's technology it's here the university is allowing students to use it basically at their will, however you want at this point. Um, mm. So it's just kind of like, just come, come down and use it and, and see what, see what it can do. You know, I'm this, this will eventually go out on Twitch. Twitch is typically a gaming platform. I'm not a gamer, but I thought streaming is that's powerful. Um, it's incredibly powerful. So let's see what we can do with it. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think, I feel like we have a lot more that we could have covered. We didn't cover some things, um, unfortunately. And I wanted to get to Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> Cause that- Oh, was I love Little House on the Prairie. That's the big, big reason I came here. Exactly. my it, Little House on the Prairie. That's yeah. right. And so it comes up in stories um, between Iran and America. And it comes up in the write-up that was done um, on your assistant professorship. So definitely if anyone's interested Definitely, definitely look up Piru's Kalaya. He's got a website um, and then he's got a whole bunch of YouTube videos. The series Stories Between Iran and America is really great. I have to give you, um, uh, say thanks and for the work that you're doing and just let you know that it's a, it's a great series and I very much enjoy it. And I recommend it to anybody out there. Um, they're, they're, short and they're compact but they're very heartfelt many of them are funny um i have to say i think your parents are kind of the stars of the series for sure oh, my, my mother tells me she goes peter's i'm a star uh, i believe it <laughs> I believe you know uh, the the other great thing is uh just since september even though i made them as youtube things mm -hmm. um i was like they're films and I've yeah. just now started submitting them to the film festivals and they're getting in. Good. Oh, good. So, That's awesome. And there's plenty so like of you can them. repurpose things. It's amazing what you can do now. You know? For sure. Okay. So then that's another, that's another thing is we got to get people in your classes. So do you know what you're going to be teaching for spring? Yeah, I'm going to be doing. Um, so what, what they'll do is every semester I'll do a script writing course and okay. then I'll have a different focus. 
So uh, this semester it'll be television writing. Okay. And I think it's called script writing too, but from here on out, it'll just be called script writing, you know, sub slash whatever, whatever it is like adaptation or, you know, horror cinema, whatever it might be. Okay. And great. the other one I'm doing is a production course. Okay. So it's digital storytelling across all media platforms. Nice. So you learn how to do all of it. How are you going to do a TikTok? Are you going to make a museum piece? How do you do a personal story? How do you make a short film? You learn it all. Great. Are the are either of those classes full? Do you know? They are close to full. So okay. if if they're watching this now, they need to sign up. Soon. Get on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then are you okay with people reaching out to your SIU email? Yeah, they can reach out to the SIU email and I have office hours usually on Mondays and Wednesdays from nine to 12. Okay. Um, and there, and I've had a lot of students come in and you can just write your name on my door. I, I put up a schedule and then you're, you're locked in once you, once you ink it. Okay. Um, and then that half hour block is yours. Okay, so you're good with people dropping in, writing their name on the schedule. Of course, that's what I'm here that for. Great. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for the time that you've given me today. Um, I will keep you posted on when this actually does stream. So we'll make sure that gets out and we will get some people watching it. And um, so I'll keep you posted on that. Definitely, we'll keep in touch. I'm very impressed with your work. So I'll definitely keep watching for, for new stuff, new content. Um, so I'll keep an eye on your website and the YouTube page. But thank you again very much. I appreciate it. And um, have a great holiday season. Hopefully you'll get to see your family, I hope. I hope. And um, uh, hopefully make some more episodes while I'm there too. Oh, good. And I hope I hope you have a wonderful holiday. And thank you so much for doing this. Um, I think it's fantastic. And you've got a great energy. And I can foresee... I can foresee even more of these and even more possibilities. So maybe there's a time when you and I can talk more about um, different things that we could even uh, do together. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Yes, I would love that. We'll, we'll definitely have to get together again and we'll, we'll talk more. So we'll sign off for now. But again, thank you very much. This has been great. And uh, we'll end the recording here and um, hang on one hang around one second and we'll, we'll say our goodbyes. So hang on one moment and I'll stop the recording. Okay.